uh, be here uh, to be sharing at AMPS after so many years of being part of AMPS. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to sharing today on pursuing non-academic careers in higher education. Uh, so just to give a heads up, there is a hashtag on Twitter. And because you all attended the, I'm assuming the workshop last time, you're all familiar with hashtags. So go for your life. Um, and yeah, so I'm from the, I'm currently working at the ARC Centre of Excellence for children and families over the life course. It is quite a um, tongue twister. And so we just tend to call it the Life Force Centre or even the LCC for short. So my main caveat to what I'm sharing today is there are many ways to scale a wall. Uh, and so the advice that I want to share today may not be all of it for you. Maybe you just want to take some of it away. I figure it's a little bit like um, parenting when you get all the advice that you can, but your kids are going to be your own. And um, so it's best to just, you know yourself best. So take what you want. I won't be offended if you take none of it, but um, I hope some of it is helpful. For myself, it has been a long and windy road to get to this point in time. Um, if I move that, does it? No, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I started uh, my studies. I was fortunate to have um, a family that didn't require me to study in order to get a job. That was never... Um, the impetus that they instilled in me. It was always study what you love. And so I headed off to university and did a Bachelor of Science in Advanced Maths with an honours, because really, what kind of a job can you get with that other than an academic kind of one? This is 20 years ago, I should point out. Um, and so I, I came to university, I did my, my honours year, um, and I actually applied, oh, I'm going backwards in time. I applied for uh, a PhD at the end of that because I had got first class honours so I thought well that's the next thing that you do uh, and my PhD the honours project was actually in theoretical physics I don't know how it's a long story about how you can do a the theoretical physics thesis when you didn't study any thesis any physics but the it was in brain modelling and I had done maths psychology and music as the subjects of my degree. Um, I'd done the most amount of music that you could within a science degree. And then I was in a psychology lecture one time and they were talking about these physicists in the, in the university that were studying brain modeling. And I was like, that's what I wanna do. So I um, went and did honors project uh, with Peter Robinson there. And I applied to a, a PhD and I got accepted for the PhD, but I didn't get a scholarship. Uh, and at that point, up until um, then, I put the little purple star there. I was kind of on the track that, oh, I guess I'm just gonna stay at university and I'll just keep studying because I don't really know what I wanna be when I grow up. Uh, but when I didn't get the scholarship, I thought, oh no, it's time to grow up. It's time to be an adult and go into the real world and get a job. Uh, so I got a job in the finance industry and I stayed there for eight, years or so and the final role that I was in in the company it was a small to medium enterprise and I was the operations manager for national accounts um, but I was a little bit like bored and missed the intellectual stimulation of, of learning so I started a master's of education mainly because uh, to be honest the uh, the gym at Macquarie University. I lived near Macquarie University and the gym had just opened and it was a really nice gym. And my this makes me sound really trivial. My husband was an um, alumni of Macquarie and he got half price gym membership. And so I didn't see why I had to pay full price when he got half price. So I was just like, what could I enroll in that would be interesting to learn that um, would give me half price gym membership? And it just so happened my, the finance company that I worked at supported education and so, um, I was doing a lot of workplace training things. So I was like, oh, this master's is pretty cheap compared to some of the other masters because the government subsidized it. Long story short, they paid for me to do the masters of education and I um, got half price gym membership. But then I had two kids and so I wasn't going to the gym anyway. <laughs> um, and after that, the final three subjects of that master's was all about um, 
parenting programs and teaching parents to be parents because um, there's a lot to learn raising kids. Uh, and so I hope you've already picked up that a lot of my education along the way is purely based on my interests and not necessarily um, has been career focused. But when I finished up that master's, uh, the supervisor that I was working with on my final project had said to me, if you've ever thought about doing a PhD, now is the time to apply because Macquarie University was about to change their rules for getting into the PhD. Uh, and so if I didn't have um, a master's of research, I wouldn't qualify for the PhD program. So I decided, well, I'll just now or never, I'll do it part-time and that's what I did. And I almost enrolled, I applied to do a PhD in psychology, um, looking at emotional development in children, building on what I'd done in my master's. And I was in a meeting with the sort of neuro um, <coughs> supervisor that I had. And I said offhand, oh, I don't suppose there's anyone that does anything with the brain and music because I've you know, always kind of been interested in that. And then he was like, oh, yes, haven't you heard of Bill Thompson? And da, 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 da. So, um, so I went home like so excited, like, like it was Christmas. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Um, so after all this time of sort of, I was heading towards that pink star and coming away, suddenly I was like, oh, maybe this dream could come true. Maybe I could study music in the brain and maybe I could make a career of that. At some point during my PhD, and so I was part-time doing it. So it took me five and a half years or almost six years to do. I started to think I should probably hedge my bets because to be honest, I wasn't um, able, because of my family and the situation we were in, I wasn't going to be able to move overseas to do a postdoc. And I knew that a postdoc within Australia was going to be potentially tricky to find. It was going to be a lot of outside of my control type things. Uh, and so I started hedging my bets and um, intentionally doing things with the aim of perhaps if I don't end up in academia, then these skills will still be useful. Um, and so in that way, I started heading toward the blue star, which makes sense, I think, where I've ended up because if you think of the finance heading in that direction and the academia heading in that, it's kind of meeting in the middle. So during that um, PhD process, I took on various research assistant roles, um, teaching roles, uh, and then once I'd actually finished my PhD, um, I had different professional roles that I took on as well. Uh, so uh, being the administrator for a really small research centre that just had a handful of investigators doing work as an outreach coordinator for the first centre of excellence that was mentioned um, the, oh, for, of cognition and its disorders and now as the node administrator for the Life Force Centre. And really, there are quite a variety of professional roles available within higher education, which people aren't always uh, aware of. I, I certainly wasn't. And so within the University of Sydney, there's the research management portfolio or research portfolio. And within that, you can get jobs writing grants or submitting applications pre and post award. Um, looking at research integrity or data management. There's also a stream of um, professional roles within the university, uh, within schools or faculties that are looking at administration in learning and teaching or research or a number of other areas, finance, recruitment. Uh, one area that I've recently discovered, which I think uh, is really exciting, is researcher development. So they're the types of people that are training the HDR uh, students with the skills that they need um, beyond the PhD, as well as ECR development and increasingly um, measuring research impact for the era um, engagement and everything. Um, and then on the furthest right side, that research centre management is kind of where I'm currently sitting. So I um, am basically the, the manager for the Sydney node, which is just one node of a multiple node centre, but there's also uh, various size centres that you could be involved in. So some centres are funded by universities where they give them some seed funding and you might get a role to be the office manager or the um, project officer for that centre for the period of that funding. 
um, all the way up to multinodal, um, multi-institution centres uh, and everything in between. Some centres involve industry, others are all just um, universities. So some of the myths about professional careers that I thought I would just touch on briefly today before we get into, I've got five practical steps um, that you could try that you could try implementing today to actually um, prepare for careers as a um, research professional. But uh, I just thought I'd bust some myths. So the first one is that um, you, you might feel, oh, but it might be boring or unstimulating. Uh, but actually I've found that I'm constantly learning new things. Just this year, I've been um, particularly learning Power BI, which is a powerful analysis and dashboard tool used at the university. Um, in previous roles, I had to learn um, Squiz, which is like the website backend for that um, Macquarie University uses. And I found that actually people with PhDs in professional roles, because we have the um, capacity to learn, we know how to learn, we can learn more easily and therefore we're more willing and sort of pick things up more quickly perhaps. Um, and then once you know how to do something, you become the go-to and people are like, oh, can you show me how to do this? Or suddenly you're the expert just because you were the one that took the time to learn how to do something. Um, the second myth that there's no autonomy, um, actually most of my day is fully in my control of what work I do. I'm empowered to take initiatives. Uh, for example, the uh, during COVID, when we were first in that, remember two years ago when we first went into lockdown and we thought it was only going to be like a couple of months or something. <sighs> um, there was quite a, a few new people to the centre and so I was running, um, I really like people and I really like bringing people together and so I was running social events online for the centre that was enabling people to network online, um, doing different games and things um, so I was really able to play to my own strengths in the role that I have. Uh, the third point there, some people I think see it as a failure. Well, I did this PhD and then I didn't become an academic. I didn't, uh, I don't know, I didn't make it, I didn't cut it. Uh, but I've actually found that within the university setting, if you're a professional with a PhD, you get more respect from both the academics and from the other professional staff because the academics see you as someone that appreciates what they're trying to achieve, what they've gone through. Um, you know what it's like submitting papers and getting rejections and dealing with bureaucracy as a student. Um, but then on the professional side, um, you also can see the, the requirements and why you need that bureaucracy, maybe not all of it. Maybe that's part of the having to see both sides. You can sort of go, well, we don't need that. And we'll, we can do this better. Uh, but I'm definitely don't see uh, my, I'm actually happier in the role that I'm in now than I ever have been. So, um, and I think the main point of that is not only because I can use the skills that I have and I have the flexibility to really hone in and, and play to my strengths, but also just better job security and to be honest, work-life balance. So I clock off at the end of the day and that's it. There's when I was doing my PhD, there was always that feeling hanging over my head, like, oh, there's another paper to read. There's another, um, you know, paper I have to write. And it was just the to-do list just never felt done. Um, and for myself, I need clarity and um, security. And just maybe that's why I did maths, because I like there to be a right answer. And so the ambiguity in research um, when I realised when I realised that feeling didn't go away when I submitted my PhD, I thought, yeah, maybe a whole career for this is not for me. Uh, and so, I'm going to move to these five practical steps. Um, and to be fair, I'm saying to prepare you for a future non-academic career. If you did these five steps, you're still actually going to be ahead in an academic career too. So, probably everybody should be doing this sort of stuff. Uh, so the first one is connect intentionally. Um, and I've got there, ask people about their career journeys. 
So some people call it men like informal mentoring, other people call it networking. Uh, but when it comes down to it, everything is people. And so being intentional about connecting with others uh, is so vital in any career that you're going to have. Uh, and so just one example of something that I've actually started doing in the last probably 18 months is if I'm ever in a situation like a training seminar or something and they do breakout rooms and you know you meet people really quickly or something like that if I hear that they have an interesting job or I'm like oh what's what does that involve or where are they working um, I will take note of their name and if I don't get the chance in the breakout room to say hey can I email you um, I'll just email them anyway and after the fact email them and say hey for, for example this happened only a couple of weeks ago um, there was we were in a workshop and we had to say what the best thing that we liked about our job was and I wrote that I really love bringing researchers together and seeing them develop and someone wrote something very similar wording almost at exactly the same time as me. And I was like, who is this person? I've never heard of her and I should reach out and talk. Um, so I did just that. I said, hey, we answered the same, um, we answered this question at the same time and um, it was the same response. So should we talk? Uh, and she was lovely and she, we had a coffee chat and um, the, um, and it, it turned out she was actually looking for someone that, her direct report was about to go on a secondment and so she was like oh there might be an opportunity for you to come and work with us and it didn't eventuate because of the timing and um, I didn't have the availability but you just never know where these conversations will take you. Uh, so I've tried to be intentional and try to make um, those sorts of things happen once a quarter. So that's my that's my goal and so my first challenge to you have I gone to sleep here is to identify four possible interesting people that you could ask about their career journeys and it could be as easy as going through like the um, org chart at your university or it could be someone within um, AMPS at another university that you know um, just and it, it could even be an academic like it doesn't have to be um, a professional staff but identify four people. And then a bonus challenge is to reach out to one of them to arrange a meeting. Can you do that? I'll leave it up to you. Okay, number two, write for non-academics. So uh, at that turning point where I thought maybe I should hedge my bets, I'd watched a um, TEDx talk and I couldn't find it, I'm sorry. Um, but it really struck with me about a person in a similar situation who thought I need to get better at communicating science if I'm going to um, pursue this. And so, um, one of so at that point I thought, well, I need to get better at writing uh, writing for non academics. So I started a blog. Um, you don't have to start a blog. You can write for all sorts of different avenues. The ants newsletter. You could write up papers for that. Um, you can submit papers to uh, the conversation or anything. But one story that I just wanted to share, um, which was probably, uh, it taught me the most in the process, was try to write for um, outlets that you're gonna learn from, that are gonna give you feedback and make you better. Because there was one, um, there was an online, journal, a science communication journal called Signal to Noise. I don't even think it's running anymore because it was run by PhD students. Um, and they were over in Stanford and they were doing chemical stuff, nothing to do with music psychology. Uh, but I'd seen on Twitter that they were having this call for, you know, papers to publish in their, um, their sort of online uh, magazine. And so I had at that point had some blog papers where I'd written about other people's research. So I thought, oh, easy, I've already written something. I'll just forward it through to them. Well, it came back completely ripped to shreds. Like, this doesn't make sense. What is this? Like, just, I felt completely gutted, like worse than academic rejections. Like it was just like, oh, because this was like for my own fun. Like this wasn't, no one was paying me or asking me to do this. I did this off my own bat and I thought, oh, and I sat on it for a couple of days. I thought, no, 
this could be a good learning opportunity. This could actually um, teach me something that I wouldn't gain elsewhere. So I persisted through the struggle. And in the end, and there was many iterations, um, the final product was really good. I was really proud of it. They actually had a graphic designer that did a figure and we had like it was a, um, because it was talking about a musical stimuli paper. And so they, we even like made the musical stimuli ourselves and added it so that the graphic played around. It was, it was really fun. Um, so I thought, that, so that was worth it. So I had that tagged to like pinned to the top of my Twitter profile. You know, when you have a publication, I didn't have a publication at that point. So I had this pinned to the top of my Twitter profile and I was on, um, the one big international trip of my PhD, you know, presenting to different places. And it just so happened that I presented, I was um, again through Twitter um, connections, intentionally connecting, was able to speak at UCL's Sophie Scott's lab. Um, and she had done a photo of me presenting and she was like, you know, great talk by Rebecca Golding on auditory imagery or something. Um, and within 24 hours, the person, the, the magazine, like emailed me and said, what just happened? Because like the, the hits to that article have just spiked. They've gone through the roof, like more than we've had before. And I was like, oh yeah, that's the Sophie Scott factor. Cause she had, you know, like 35,000 followers or something. So all these people have gone, what's this? And I thought, oh, I should have had something about my own research at the top. Anyway, it didn't matter. Um, but you just never know where those kind of things are going to lead to. So, um, and the even better thing was after Sophie Scott's lab, we then had um, ICMPC in San Francisco, which was super fun. And the author of the paper, whose I had been writing about, was the speaker before me in the conference, like, like the order of the talks. And so after the thing, I was able to say, hey, I wrote this thing about your paper and it's getting lots of you know views or something. Um, so you just never know where it's gonna lead. So I would just encourage you to be on the lookout um, to try some different things. So the challenge is to identify some outlets that you could write for, particularly those that will give you critical feedback. Um, and then the bonus is actually give yourself a deadline. Say, I'm gonna do this by June to actually submit something. There's no harm in just putting a pitch out there, seeing if it'll bite. Um, but I did, I did learn a lot through that process. Uh, third point, present to non-academics. Uh, really important to get comfortable speaking in front of different audiences. And you really need to be proactive in finding opportunities, at least at the start. Um, I think the main turning point for me with this was entering the three minute thesis at my university because I entered it thinking, oh, um, cause I was part-time, I don't, you had to be at least six months into your candidature. So it was technically my second year, um, but it was still within my part-time first year um, that I entered. And I thought if I do anything, I'm not gonna do it half-heartedly. So I wrote out my script, but then I got feedback on it from those HDR um, support people at the university that were helping run the um, three minute thesis. And they were great. They gave me like really obvious feedback that I hadn't seen um, when I had uh, initially written it. And I also signed, um, and then you sort of get a taste for it and you're like, oh, like I did, I ended up doing pretty well, surprised, like I was really quite surprised. And so then I started to look for other opportunities. Uh, and one of them was called Soapbox Science, which was basically a thing about promoting women in science and you wear a white lab coat and you stand on a soapbox in the street and you just like tell passers-by about your science. And again, um, I signed up to this because part of the um, event was a one-day training that they provided. And to be honest, I wanted the training and I wanted the connections with the other people that were also going to be the speakers because I thought there might be some, you know, big wigs, who knows. Um, and so I signed up for this thing. In the end, the actual event, it rained. I spoke for, you're supposed to have an hour on your thing. I think I spoke to 
maybe 25 people came and walked like it wasn't a big event but someone captured it on Twitter and tweeted about it and then it was like oh so anyway um so look for look for opportunities where you're going to get that feedback and if you're really interested I'd really recommend a book by Viv Grosbach called How to Own the Room um it's again it's particularly aimed at females but I think the information in there is awesome for anybody. Uh, and just in preparing this talk, I noticed that Fame Lab, which is another opportunity, does have um, its deadline on the 30th of April, which, you know, if you don't sleep, you've got three days to um, <laughs> pull together a video. Um, but just all of those kinds of opportunities, why not? Someone's got to win them. You may as well give it a go. Um, and the ABC Media Residency too, like anything that's going to give training, I would I would always go for. Uh, and the the whole TEDx thing. I should, so the way that I got invited to speak was actually again through Twitter. Um, someone that we knew, uh, I had developed like I had gotten to know her over a number of years through Twitter. And I knew she was doing a PhD at Macquarie University. And then she started a shut up and write group. And I was like, that's what I need. Cause you know, when you're in that final bit of your PhD and you just got to write. Um, and so I started going along to that. And then she mentioned, oh, she was, she, cause that whole event was organized by PhD students at Macquarie University. Um, they took it on themselves. They got all the permission. Uh, because she was doing a PhD in implementation science and she didn't want to get to the end of it and not have actually implemented anything. So she decided alongside her PhD in medical implementation, she would organise a TEDx event, um, as you do. Uh, and so she had said, and, and I had said offhand, I was like, oh, that would be, that would be really scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do a TEDx talk. I was really relieved in the three-minute thesis. I said the previous time they'd done a TED event at Macquarie, the winner of the three minute thesis had to come back the following day and redo their talk for the TED event. And I had come second and I was like, I was so relieved to come second because then I didn't have to come back and do it. And she's like, and I, maybe, maybe it was that playing hard to get, I don't know. But then she was like a week later, she said, oh, do you want to come and speak at the TEDx Macquarie thing? So you just never know where these conversations will head. Um, similarly, there was an event this sounds like science that um, Jackie Randalls was organizing at the city recital hall. Um, and she was doing it for quite a few years and I supported it on Twitter and was sort of sharing it like, oh, isn't this a great event? And she'd reached out to me at the start. And when she realized I was a PhD student, she was like, oh, okay, maybe I'll speak to you when you're finished or in a few years or something. Um, and then when she saw the TEDx thing, she then, contacted me and said, I'll come and do one of these. Um, and it was wild because I did this, she, she wanted something a bit more um, entertainment value. So I talked about, um, like, a, did about the same kind of topic of musical imagery, but also talked about improvisation. And I had my friend who's an opera singer and also uh, into improvisational opera come and she I played the piano like the baby the Steinway the beautiful piano at the city recital hall and I'm like da, 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 and she was singing and it was amazing so you just never know where opportunities will take you um, so the challenge for presenting is to identify events that you could present at again that will learn um, where you can learn how to present better so you can even um, there's plenty of different resources available, like I said, that book, but there's others um, that will really teach you uh, to hone those skills because the better you are at presenting, uh, the better your ideas come across. And therefore, even in academia, it's going to make it, um, it's just going to make it easier. So then commit to applying for an upcoming event. I'm all about set a goal, you've got to do it. Um, my favorite one, do a joy audit. I don't know if you've ever done one of these before, but a joy audit is where you sit back and think, what is the thing in, you could do it in your whole life or just in your work day. What is the thing that I've done in the last week or month that's brought me the most joy at work? What is the thing that I would do even if people didn't pay me to do it? I would just do it for fun. Because the challenge is, how can you find a career or a job that will pay you to do those things? 
that I can maximize the joy because every job's going to have stuff that is boring. But uh, but how can I maximize the joy? So for me, I loved attending conferences, but I realized that the main um, the main buzz that I got was meeting someone, was meeting new people, and then finding out, oh, you study that. Oh, have you met this person? They study that. And then having them go, oh, no, I haven't met them, but I'd be interested. And then me going, well, come over here and let me introduce you. And you too, okay, like matchmaker. I love doing matchmaking, academic matchmaking. Um, and I loved, uh, I loved communicating science and talking about science, but I really didn't love doing it. Like I didn't, I didn't love data collection. I used to feel sick in the stomach when, because um, there's just so many things that can go wrong, especially with like brain imaging that I used MEG and the, there's so many things that could go wrong. And so the mornings of testing, I'd be like, oh, not feeling great. I hated paper rejections. Um, and I really hated the clarity of um, analysis pipelines uh, because I felt like it was all very arbitrary of, of what, could be done. So how was I to know that I was doing the right thing? Um, and so doing that joy order. And also at one point, after I had finished my PhD, I went to speak um, to probably the only person that I would have done a, a postdoc with if I had done a postdoc. And they said, so what's your five-year plan? And I suddenly realized I don't really have one. I just want to work with good people. And do good research. And then on the train ride home, because it was quite a way back home, I was like, actually, I don't want to even do the research. I just want to facilitate the research. I want research to happen. I'm passionate about it. I want other people to do it. <laughs> and I just want to celebrate their achievements. Um, and so all of that sort of led me to pursue more of a professional career. Um, but it would be interesting, I think, if you do your own joy audit and see what it is about your days, your weeks that you love the most, and then how can you maximise that? Do you love meetings? Then join committees where there's lots of meetings. Do you hate meetings? Then don't join committees. It's, you know, that sort of thing. Now, the final one, be brave and ask. Um, so they won't offer you the job if they don't know you're interested. Uh, you really have to put yourself out there. And I actually, I think it was Peter Keller, I asked, like, how do you get a postdoc? And he's like, well, you just tell people that you're looking. You just tell people that you need a job. Um, so the same is true in academic jobs as well as professional roles. And the, the current role that I have, um, well, the, the first role at the Centre for Cognition and Its Disorders was as outreach coordinator. And I got that role because they originally, the person that was doing the role left, and so they had a vacancy and the um, I was still doing my PhD. And so I emailed the chief operating officer and said, I would really love to do this because it's, you know, social media and it's sharing about all the great research that we're doing, but I'm still doing my PhD. So I couldn't really commit more than two days a week to doing it. Um, and they were nearing the end of the center. And so they needed to spend the money. So they're like, well, we need someone full time, uh, which was fair enough, but then, when the person that they did hire ended up leaving three months before the centre finished up, they just came straight to me and said, We've, we can only offer six months full-time work, but, um, but you're welcome to have it if you want it, or you can work less. We'll, we'll have you for any amount of hours that you can work. Um, and so I finished the PhD on the whatever Friday, went on a holiday, came back the following Monday and started as the outreach coordinator for this um, Centre for Cognition and Its Disorders. It only had three months to run officially, but then um, they got renewal for um, to sort of spend down the last part of the money. And the date that we were finishing just kept on extending. And then I ended up staying there for until the end of that, uh, must have been 2019. Um, so saying saying yes in some professional roles might lead to further, even if it's not immediately what you think you want, you never know where it's gonna lead. And so one thing, the challenge here is who is one person that you would like to work for or work with? 
and commit to reaching out to them and telling them, I want to work with you and asking them if they have anything available. What's the worst they could say? No, but at least next time they'll, they might say yes um, or they'll contact you when they do. So just some final helpful resources. The Australasian Research Management Society, I didn't even know this, but um, research management in Australia is becoming a whole career. And so there's societies around it. You can get accredited to be um, like a fellow and then they have they have conferences too and academics, well, people with actually it's mainly people with PhDs that are working as research professionals are sharing about their own learnings within the university context. And this is what we're trying here and this is working. And um, so I really love that, that they're sort of, meta researching themselves um, and, and sharing that knowledge. So that's a website that you can look for more resources. The Campus Morning Mail is a email that you can subscribe to. It's like a news feed that comes uh, every morning. It's just good for keeping your pulse, keep a finger on the pulse of higher education in Australia, which is something that I had not heard about until I started in a professional role. Um, obviously, the thesis whisperer has all sorts of great stuff and including on alternative careers. And then there's How to Own the Room, Women in the Art of Public Speaking, especially the audio book. I love it when an author reads their own book. feels like they're talking straight to me. Uh, I would highly recommend that. Uh, so that is our five practical steps. Connect intentionally, practice writing for non-academics, practice presenting to non-academics, do a joy audit and be rave. And now questions. So I will stop.